our next speaker is my fellow countryman, all the way from Germany, co-founder and chief technologist of a successful Berlin startup, Camunda. And I would like to give the stage and your warm hand of applause to Bernd Rucker. Thank you, thank you, welcome. Yeah, I wanna talk about surviving the hyper automation low code bubbles, a lot of buzzwords in the title. Let me, let me quickly start with the, with the story, which is kind of also some motivation for a lot of those things. So last year, um, recently I talked to a lot of banks for some, for, some, uh, for some reason, and last year I was sitting together with a couple of executives there in a bank, and they were looking at the bank account opening process. So whenever you wanna have a new bank account, you probably go online, you enter a couple of data, and then that whole process kicks off until you have your bank account ready, your IBAN ready to use, and so on and so forth. And they wanted to, first of all, improve the quality, but very specifically also looked at the customer experience, in that case, the speed of things making it happen. And they had a very concrete idea of what the competition could do. They, they, because they could do it, and they had a very specific number of a couple of minutes in order to um, open up a new bank account, for example. And they needed a couple of days, actually. And re recently, when I opened up a new bank account, I'm currently six weeks in the process for certain banks. So um, there seems to be a problem there. And the, the situation, if you look behind the curtain within the IT systems of these kind of uh, organizations, it's typically not that they haven't automated anything. They, they have automated certain steps that need to happen in that whole um, bank account opening. That was a trick here. Okay. Yeah. Good. Everybody's awake now. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so they, of course, also have a couple of systems um, that do certain of those tasks, um, probably automated. They don't use pen and pencil to, to calculate the score for a customer and so. But what they didn't look at typically is the whole process, like end to end, what has to happen in what order and how are these connections are being done. Very often that's a point to point integration, like the website writes it somewhere, it's put in the CRM system, somebody looks at certain records there and so on and so forth. So it's a very spaghetti-like integration of these tasks in order to form that end-to-end -end thing that should happen. Okay, and that leads to, uh, first of all, a broken end-to-end -end automation. That's what you can experience as a customer if it takes too long, actually, that something happens. You might fall through the cracks if, if some, like, passing off to another system doesn't work. Mo maybe nobody even recognizes that, right? Um, a lack of understanding also internally in the organization. So if you start asking them questions like, how is the process currently implemented? Why does it take three days? Nobody has a clear and concise answer, so it's really hard to understand it. And um, that also leads to a lack of flexibility. So if I, first of all, if I don't understand the process, it's pretty hard to change it, to adjust it, right? And um, you might have to adjust a lot of nuts and bolts here and there in order to make, to ch adjust the process to, for example, be faster. So that's a situation we see in a lot of organizations, actually. That's why, so, so my background is process orchestration, so that's where you can add process orchestration as a concept, but also probably as a tooling. Um, then you might use those process model. This is um, using BPMN, it's a business process model annotation. It's an ISO standard to define these process models where you could say the exact like sequence of steps and probably also define certain um, logical things like um, under certain conditions, I go this way or the other way. You can define other things like parallel executions or whatever. You can define all these kind of things to coordinate these tasks end to end. That's what process orchestration can do. And it took me a while actually to figure out one misunderstanding I'm seeing very often when I talk about process automation. So process automation for me consists of two things. The first is like, automating certain tasks within the process. So some people think if I say process automation, it's a fully automated process. It's not necessarily like that. You might still involve humans to make decisions, to um, probably to do something, but other tasks might be automated. And the, the other axis is kind of the process orchestration axis. With the microphone, I do that, but um, normally I do this cross because I think it's, it makes it very visual. Like you have these tasks, 
They might be manual or automated, and then you also have to look at the coordination of these tasks, and that's what process orchestration um, can do. I'm going over that very quickly, actually. For me, that's kind of the baseline. We need to understand to, to discuss certain aspects which are more interested in that. And then you can give these kind of process models to uh, virtual engines, to, to tooling that can understand it. So BPMN, um, basically in the background is an XML file you can give to engines. The engines can directly execute instances of that. So you can talk to the engine saying, kick off a new bank account opening, and then they go through that. That's what a virtual engine can do. Okay. For my background, I haven't yet introduced myself. You did very quickly, Dan Tucker, co-founder of Camunda. We're an open source process orchestration platform. So that's kind of my bias, if you will. But also, I'm I'm looking into these things for uh, roughly 15 years now. I wrote a couple of books, and if you want to reach out to me, also later on, there's my email address. Always happy to discuss things. Um, and if you look at what we do, or also what my background is, it's with what I call pro code. So basically. The idea was, or is still, or was always to hook in process orchestration concepts in, let's say, normal professional software development. Not to make it an alien. I, I still want to use CI, CD. I still want to code in whatever Java or .NET or whatever I do. Um, but I want to add these process orchestration things to it because it's not super simple to build a virtual engine, right? And we call that always developer friendly. So that's actually where we come from. And then. Um, I don't go through that in detail, but there's a GitHub link. Uh, you can also Google for that. The slides are available later on. For that whole customer onboarding example uh, in a runnable version. But I give you the very, very quick disk. And that basically means, developer friendly for me also, that in order to kick off such a, such a process instance, for example, you write a piece of code. In this case, I use Java and Spring Boot because that's my personal background, but you could also use other languages. We have SDKs for other languages. And then, whatever, expose that as a REST API, for example, to your internal world. Or if you want to add a customer to a CRM system, that might be a REST call. Again, you might write a piece of code in order to do that. So these kind of little glue codes, and then you can write either the unit tests and so on and so forth. Pro code. I hope that idea gets clear. This is how we can automate these end-to-end -end processes, these orchestrations, um, very efficiently, actually. We're doing that for quite a while now. And like, if you look at the architecture, it could be uh, a Spring Boot application, for example. And then you add the process model as an XML file, can be part of your development project. Um, you need a bit of SDK. Um, you might need your own code, for example, to talk to the REST API. And you might use Common or a different engine in order to run it, right? And yeah, right. There are a couple of advantages of that. So this is something you could do. Okay. Right, and I always love showing that because that very often gives people that don't know workflow engines an idea of what a workflow engine is. And then you get also all these visibility kind of things like how many process instances do I have running? So I currently have six waiting for something. I know exact timestamps. I, I get exactly that idea of why does it take so long for me to open a bank account if something is stuck? Or if there are technical problems, for example, what are the technical problems? Um, statistical data of what's going on and so on and so forth. So that's, that's kind of a great thing to do, right? Okay. Let's, let's assume we do that. And we do that with a lot of, lot of banks recently and bank accounts opening. It doesn't automatically speed up your bank account opening, right? It might do because you at least know like customers falling through the cracks anymore. That can already be a big improvement. But it doesn't bring down processing time. But it's, it's actually a great, um, great place to look into to understand like statistics, for example, where does that time go? And very often it's a human task where, where you spend time on maybe um, you have not enough people working on that. You have to wait for these approvals very long. And then you might also be able to do something about that. For example, adjusting the process that certain approvals are done automatically or applying AI for certain things or decision tables for the easy cases or whatever. But you have that basis to improve the process, which I find a, a super interesting place to be in. OK, good. Now we define process orchestration. That's one baseline we need. The second thing is, um, and I'm 
I'm not a big fan of quoting Gardner probably, but um, what Gardner coined is that hyper automation term, which I had in the title. You are here, so let's talk about hyper automation. And they coined that two or three years back. And the only important thing about that slide is Gardner coined the term, and they see a very valuable thing in hyper automation. If you look at what hyper automation is, um, you could ask ChatGPT, ChatGPT says, hyper automation is an approach to automation, blah, 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 blah. Um, I highlighted the important parts to create an end to end automated solution that can handle complex business processes. Right? And that goes beyond traditional automation, um, which typically involves automating specific tasks or process. With hardware automation, the goal is to automate as much of the entire process as possible. Which makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's not um, not surprised that we want to automate as much as possible. So my my quick <laughs> condensed like slide on hardware automation is this: we want to automate all the things, but end to end. Right? That's what hyper automation is about. Okay. So we we learned about cross orchestration. We learned about that developer friendly thing. You might have good tooling in order to to do that. So where is the challenge with that? The big challenge I see at the moment is not that it's not known that organizations have to move that direction. One of the big problems is currently what's called talent shortage. So we have that lovely approach, but we don't have all the lovely developers we need to automate everything we want to. And this is a thing, I, again, I asked ChatGPT um, to prove there's talent shortage. And you don't have to read it. I, to be honest, I hadn't read it for putting it on the slide, but it takes two boxes. I use OpenAI in the talk, so there's AI here, and it proves there's developer shortage. But you can ask um, most of the organizations out there, they don't have the number of developers they want to in order to automate whatever they need to. So now the interesting question is how, how, how to um, basically, how to automate all the things in that world. One thing that I find super interesting, so I'm in that game for, uh, let's say, more or less 15, maybe 20 years now. When I started, the world was kind of, there was the business, there is the developer. And when I started, it was even important that, that, that I'm a Java developer, it's not a .NET developer, the Woo, the .NET developer. So it was a very clear separation there, business, Java developers. And we even had that kind of wall in between. And the whole, when I started with BPMN, for example, we were discussing a lot around how can we move requirements from the one side to the other without losing too much. That was the whole thing we were discussing, like how can we get the requirements to the developers developing the right thing. And on the positive end, and we always wanted to tear down that wall, and I think on the, on the positive side, we somehow succeeded to tear down the wall. And if you look at the roles right now in most of the organizations, it's not like this anymore. It's not that binary anymore. We have a lot of like a big diversity, diverse set of roles. So that might be developers, but what's a developer? It can be something, somebody very experienced, right, doing whatever Java and Spring Boot for uh, 15 years or 20 years like me. Um, it can be a junior developer. It might be somebody just switching languages, doing something very differently. But at the same time, we also have business people that are going or having much, a much better technical understanding to do things. So we have all these kind of different people out there. And I find it an important kind of yeah, challenge now to um, include as many of those as possible in my, my basically my solution build. Okay. Because not everybody, I, I still, I'm, I'm very often puzzled by that, not everybody just wants to code and spring boot everything. Well, what the heck. Um, at the same time, if you look at processes to automate, they are also not, or they are also very diverse. So the, I, I picked three um, aspects I find most important here, criticality, and the value to the business, and the complexity of these processes. And again, if I look into a bank, I'm very bank heavy today, sorry. Um, next time I'm only telco heavy, for example. Um, if I look at there, they might have payments processes, like real money flowing around. That's a very valuable, very critical, very complex process actually to get right. Or trading, trade ops, the whole, um, I want to get trades around. Um, maybe custom onboarding, 
that depends a little bit on what they have, but it's very often also not super simple with all the know your customer and sanctions and whatever they have to take into account. Address, I added address change because I was surprised by the complexity of address change in uh, most organizations. But at the same time, you also have a long tail of sometimes very simple things. But they are also important and they are very important for the customer experience. Um, these are all the tiny bits where you're annoyed if they don't work, if you go online. And, and um, a bank, for example, has also to automate these things as part of the auto hyper automation challenge. And now, I find the important thing to understand that these processes have different kind of requirements for how we implement them. Um, and that's why it's important to categorize those use cases. And on this slide, I stole a categorization from Shell um, because they, uh, dis uh, they, they uh, disclosed that in a Forrester report, which is linked down there, um, which I find helpful. And that's actually very comparable to what I saw at, at other customers from us. So they categorized their processes into three buckets. One is the red bucket. That requires professional development. These are all the high complex, high critical um, processes. They might have compliance and regulatory requirements, and there you use all the things we know, like version control, automated testing, CID, CICD, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the easy thing. That's for us as Camuna, for example, where we were working for the last, last years very often. Then you have the, um, the green bucket, which is kind of the do-it-yourself thing. It's a very easy thing to do, but I need to automate it. I don't need a lot of governance. It's the, hey, I want to automate that thing with Sapier. I just might use it for myself, for example. I don't need governance. I don't need testing. I just do it. It's also, it's not what we here think about too much prob probably, but it's also an important part. Also easy in a way. And then you have that middle bucket, which is super interesting, the yellow one, where you have use cases that are not that complex, not that critical, but still important. And if, if they don't run, you have a problem in the organization, in the company. So you need at least some level of, 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 um, of governance. And the way I think about that now is that there are, currently there are not really tools for kind of targeting the middle so and approaches, so you either approach that from the red bucket side with these tools and make them easier to use for the yellow use cases, or you let business users use low-code tooling from the green side in these yellow buckets, and you can already foresee certain, um, yeah, certain problems they will run into, certain things that might not really work down the line. And that's an interesting question, actually, to, to look at. Right, and normally you can categorize the, by the way, the big challenge, are typically the boundaries. So is this really a yellow use case? Is there a red use case? But th that's important to understand um, in order to, to pick the right tools. If you want to dive deeper into that, I'm not going into that here today, but I, I wrote a couple of articles which I called the process automation map, which explores uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of aspects where you can categorize your process in order to better understand on, on which of these buckets you might end up with. I did that before I had these like three color buckets, so it's not directly connected, but it's very close. And then you could use, um, look at certain processes. I'm using kind of customer examples here. Helsana in Switzerland, an insurance company, they wanted to, um, like the bank account opening, they wanted to sell insurance completely online and issue the, the policy within two days doesn't sound too complicated. It is actually complicated. And if you look at that process, the um, new insurance thing, um, it's pretty unique. If it's not unique, you buy standard software, by the way. You don't do any development. But it's, it's pretty unique because they have to um, include a lot of uh, a lot of legacy systems, for example. Um, it's not super complex, maybe. Um, but it's, it's a process, and they want to run it with a proper governance and these kind of things. So it seems to me more on the right side of the spectrum, which normally means more kind of reddish here than uh, greenish. Um, another one example is Zalando. For example, Zalando is the clothes retailer you might know. You can shop clothes online. Um, every order um, goes over the Kamuna uh, platform in that case. And if you look at that process, it's very unique because they they do certain things very uniquely by purpose, so they can't just buy any shopping platform and just use it. Um, 
it's relatively complex. They are on a big scale. It's a process. They have an own department running all of that. So um, again, on the right hand side, and you have to make sure you understand that for the specific process, it's not a company wide decision for every process where you are kind of on the map to pick the right category. Gives me a second. So now, I'm. I would put the GraphCon in a in a developer conference bucket, right? and that's why I love being here. In a way, now I'm I'm, I'm talking about low code. I'm actually happy that so many people um, showed up. I was a bit uh, not sure if people are really frightened away by the topic because that's what I hear a lot. Let's talk about that. Briefly, and the way I'm I'm seeing that, or basically that was what marketing was doing out of my thoughts, is that I find low code interesting if you can tune it in. So you might know low code platforms also in the cross orchestration space that normally frighten away developers because they're they're building some kind of shields around them, and this is what it can do. And if you want to want to break out of that, you write a bit of JavaScript code in that small text field over there. That's probably possible, and that's it. So that's not the way I see it. The way I see it is. Start with pro code, the stuff we had early on on the slide, and then you can tune in as much low code as you want for certain scenarios. We, by purpose, internally speak of solution acceleration, not low code, but that's a side story. So if you go back to the solution architecture we had earlier on, right, you recall that Spring Boot application. There you have, for example, Clue code, and let's make the example we want to talk to REST. So you have Clue code talking to a REST endpoint, which is technology-wise not that super challenging. I mean, it's a REST call, so you could do it in Java, but you could also go away, for example, with what we and a lot of other uh, companies in the industry call a connector. So you could use um, some connector that can already connect to REST, which you just use in your application. And I go into that a little bit more in a second. Um, that gives you a couple of advantages. First of all, you might be able to reuse the same code in different processes because you probably have to talk to certain REST endpoints all the time. You don't have to recode it all the time. One possible advantage, I'm not sure if that's so big because the, also the Java code to talk to REST is super simple, um, but you can now give it to different people, right? You can have different people using it, and that's actually pretty big. And this is how it, for example, looks like. So you, you can have add uh, REST, and then you don't add code, but you, you configure the endpoint. Okay. Normally people are, again, developers are normally a bit frightened by that. Ooh, that's some kind of black magic I don't understand. That's not the case. So um, if you look at what's a connector, it's a bit of Java code, and what we call an element template, that's basically the part what you see in the UI. Right. So. Um, I'm sorry for putting code on slide. The GitHub link again is there as well. So you have, for example, for an HTD, uh, for REST connector, you have a bit of code. I agree that most of the stuff is happening here, but it's basically it's it's a function um, written in Java. It's a bit of JSON to define what kind of properties panel you want to have, and that's it, right? And then you can hook it in the modeling tooling, and that works. So this is how we get uh, what we call a protocol connector, REST, Kafka, messaging. And to some extent, that's probably not what you would see as a local tool, um, because REST is super, super low-tech still, right? It's not nothing you want to hand out to the business. So you, you might want to go one level up and say, I want to build a connector to a certain system. That's what you can see in a lot of the integration toolings out there, like Sapia or others, where you can have a Twilio task, a Twitter task, an um, Outlook task, or whatever, a uh, Slack task, these kind of things. So that's what you could build on top. The interesting part now is that technology-wise, that probably do doesn't involve any coding because you can, Twilio is a REST API. So you can configure the REST connector in the UI part only um, to make it a Twilio connector. I spare you the details. Again, there's a bit of code linked if, if you want to dive into that. But the basic idea is you have the JSON description of the UI where you basically configure it already. You say the method is nothing somebody puts in a text field, but it's, it's always a post. And it's hidden. 
because we don't want to show it to anybody. And the headers means we, we transform a form and so on and so forth, right? There's more to it. If you want to read it back, um, there you go. Um, then you have a Twilio connector thing. Now, the next thing to think about is, is that the right level to involve other people like, let's say, business folks to whatever extent to build processes them, themselves? Um, probably also not, because that also requires a lot of knowledge, like we use Twilio to send SMS. That's something you need to know. You need to know how to use Twilio. You probably need to know how to authenticate to Twilio. What are the rules we use internally in the company to use Twilio and so on and so forth. So um, what you can do on top of that is to build a very specific connector, for example, to send an SMS. And because you might leverage Twilio underneath, it's again just a bit of JSON to narrow it down, to pre-configure to certain things, but it, it, it brings you to a different level conceptually. Now the person using it does not even have to know about Twilio. And I find this kind of cascade how you, how you basically shield the kind of Java code, the technical details more and more very interesting to think about to enable other roles. Yeah, and you need a bit of tooling to make that happen and whatever. Um, to enable other roles to participate in these kind of like process automation or process orchestration endeavors. And this is very different, actually very different approach to what I see a lot of low-cost vendors are doing. They're dumping a big pile of um, connectors to you. Here, they are, just use them. But it's normally not what, what makes it happen within the organizations. Because if we look, and that's a different viewpoint on the same thing, if we look at like development projects, again, traditionally it was like, we had business people defining requirements. We had a hopefully good business analyst like getting the requirements out of them, and we had a development team implementing that. And if we we're good, they were communicating like both ways, and we got a feedback. We might have done it like in an agile, iterative manner, um, back and forth, but that was more or less, or is more or less how it works in a lot of the cases. And the alternative then is very often you have business folks using local tooling, and there was, I forgot the number, unfortunately, but Gartner had a number, how many solutions are built by the business only without the involvement of the IT, which is a quite high number, um, which normally makes IT very angry for, if they are greenish use cases, not a big problem. If they are somewhere yellow, getting to the right-hand side, getting reddish, then you have a big problem normally because you can't put the right governance of that. It's a, it's a very coordinated thing. So what you can do actually, and I see that happening in a couple of organizations now, is you can build a much more diversified team. You might still have developers on the team, maybe less. They might prepare certain things. They might prepare these connectors of what we just saw. They might be very specific to your project or to your organization. You can still code them, but then you can put them into, into a form and shape that others um, might be the ones that, that basically stitch together the process. And that reduces a lot of the, we're talking about that next cognitive load also for these people, because that means like technical folks can really concentrate better on the technical problems and business folks can probably concentrate much better on the process because they have these kind of knowledge. So from, from my perspective, that's a big win-win situation. And yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that happening at certain organizations, but not very often actually. And that's something I think we, we have to change. Of course, we still have other people somehow involved. And that brings me to, um, to uh, actually team topologies is something that's referred to in a lot of the talks, which is great actually. I like the book, very good concepts. They, um, there's another talk from uh, Manuel tomorrow morning, don't miss that. Um, and they know four fundamental topologies, so stream-aligned teams, they do the business value, enabling teams, they basically help them achieving something, complicated subsystem teams, so if you have a very technical thing to do, um, you might have them in a separate team. And you have platform teams building everything that's helping the stream-aligned team to go faster in a way. And this is how they visualize it, yet, right? So you have all these kind of streams, the platform underneath, um, and probably the as a service team. And if we, if we think back of the customer onboarding example, for example, um, 
um, these kind of enabling teams could be a process um, automation center of excellence, for example. We see center of excellence is very often at customers. Um, the stream aligned team is the bank account opening. That's what I want to do. And they should be able to focus on bank account opening problems. What do I need to do in what order and why? Where do I have to be compliant to certain regulations? Where, um, where do I need to involve know your customer things or compliance check or whatever? That's what they care about and what they automate. And then they might have like something like fraud detection might be very technical could be an own complicated subsystem team, and then they need the platform, and that could be something, um, okay, I'm selfish here, Camunda and X, um, which basically also can mean that very often for our customers, they combine kind of the process automation center of excellence with the platform team in a way, so they also pre-built connectors, for example. You run them, they, uh, they are kind of the intern internal consulting agency running around the organization to help. And that's actually a very efficient way, I think, to, um, to let the stream aligned teams focusing on, on the work. Speaking of that, um, let's quickly talk about microservices, very quickly at least. So I, I did a lot of talks on microservices over the last years. And the way we kind of agreed on, also on the conferences, but also with our customers, is that if you do microservices and you have processes, it's very natural that the processes are domain logic. The domain logic should live in a certain microservice because then you have the ownership and a lot of things clarified. If you think of microservices, you might think of autonomy, team autonomy. So that might mean you want to have that all of those teams, if they use a process, if they want to use a workflow engine, they might use probably in different tooling, but at least different kind of instances of the engine to not be dependent on others. It's kind of an isolation thing. And that's actually what a lot of customers follow. The interesting thing now is it also, again, it's, it puts co like kind of cognitive load, we're coming to that, um, on those teams because now they have to understand how to run an orchestration engine. And now what we're seeing, we're moving kind of to a, to a SaaS model. So first of all, as a, so you can get a SaaS, um, we're having a SaaS offering as Kamuna, but a lot of customers do that internally. They build their kind of internal SaaS model for their customers to have, to basically maintain and offer the orchestration engine as a capability, so you don't have to care about that. And I find that a very, very valuable view. And this does not mean, and that's a discussion I have so often, that does not mean that this is unhealthy centralization. When I, when I show that pictures very often, um, oh, yeah, you have that central like platform capability there, this orchestration thing, Kamuna is a spider in the web. That's, that's not a good idea. We, we do decouple microservices. We won't, don't want to have that. But that does not mean that. It does not mean that you set the guardrails so, so close that nobody can move anymore. It, but it also means that you don't let everybody do what they want because that's pretty hard to govern, actually. It's pretty hard to understand what's happening and let every team kind of reinvent the wheel. There, I like this picture actually when talking about microservices. I learned that from Eric Evans once, the, the uh, kind of inventor of DDD, if you will. Um, it's a three-legged race, so the people are bound together by their feet and then they should run. And what you can easily imagine is that if, if you cut the like bound here, there on their feet, they can run faster. That's the analogy you can use for microservices, so you don't want to have teams bound together because that slows them down. And, and that's, so you want to have the autonomy with the team and so on and so forth. That makes sense, it does make sense, but it doesn't mean that every of the runner should stitch all their clothes themselves, right? Because that's not efficient. It means they have to do two hours of work before they can start running like a minute probably. So that's not efficient, that's not what it should do. And I, I think that was understood wrongly in a lot of, a lot of customer scenarios. There's one thing which I like, um, c coming up two years ago I think from Spotify, there was a blog post which a lot of people um, actually saw probably, what, where they defined what they call a golden path. So Spotify started with a lot of autonomy for the teams and then they learned that and they, I, I, I love the quote, they learned that when they grew the organization, when they got bigger and bigger, they couldn't longer sustain that. All the teams are reinventing the wheel. 
they, they called it rumor-driven development, because I heard that team is doing that architecture, so we probably should also do that. And that's not a very sustainable thing. It's not scalable to the organization. So you probably want to have certain guardrails. And they call that golden path. It's, it's basically a definition of a stack with the how-tos to get started. So how should I build a web application in Spotify, for example? And then they give you uh, not only the tutorial, but also the tools you use. And then um, you make it efficient. You make it efficient for this team to start. And the way, and I love this. I, 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 I was kind of aware, but I relearned that from the team topology spot, where they go very, very uh, deeply into the cognitive load topic. So cognitive load is everything I need to have on my brain in order to do something. And there are different types of cognitive load. The intrinsic cognitive load is something, um, the fundamentals. So if I want to program in Java, I need to know what, how to program in Java, what a class is, what a method is, and so on and so forth. I probably learned that during education. Right? Then there are the extraneous cognitive load, which um, is all the environmental things like, oh, I need to deploy that, how to deploy that, where to put it on GitHub, these kind of things. And then this Germany cognitive load is the real business problem, the real task of what I want to do. And the, the goal is always to, to minimize those intrinsics and extraneous cognitive loads to let the people focus on what's really important. And I find this thought super key to thinking about how to define like your team topology, also how to define your architecture. And also if you do microservice, for example, it doesn't mean dumping everything on the team. They should reinvent it. No, you want to reduce still their cognitive load. So, um, and things like higher abstractions or, or mixing the right people in the team can really reduce intrinsic load or um, golden path, um, using a platform, using a center of excellence, reducing strenuous um, cognitive load. So that's a big help for teams, for the stream aligned teams to produce something. Okay. Cool. Um, if you're interested in that, there's also another talk, I think tomorrow morning, I guess. Yeah, tomorrow morning by Nick Tune. I can also recommend that. Um, so in a way, I think <laughs> microservice phrase autonomy. Okay. And that's great, but that does not mean to dump more cognitive load on the teams. And that's a misunderstanding I'm seeing so much. Um, you, it doesn't mean to define the right boundaries to do something properly, domain boundaries. But then you should enable those teams to do their work properly. And that includes like also center of things like center of excellence, platforms, and these kind of things. It could also mean providing these kind of pre-built connectors to business people in the same team to do things faster than a developer could do that, first of all, has to learn about business requirements. It could mean a lot of things, but I like this way of thinking about things, of how to pull together teams, right? How to enable other people to participate in the whole um, cross-orchestration. Right, so kind of as a summary, so we have process orchestration. We have the pro code part of our process orchestration. That's kind of checked. We know how to do that. It can be very, it's very easy to get started. It's pretty successful, but you need software developers for doing that. For these um, like red bucket use cases, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, but we don't have enough talent to, to apply that for all the yellow bucket use cases. So how to go there, enable other people to help out in these projects other roles, and one way of doing that, I, there are more, by the way, there are more, we, we also have things like DMN, um, domain um, decision model annotation, so that kind of decision tables, for example, there are a couple of those methods where you can pull in the business to do certain things and enable them to do certain things. Connectors um, is another example of doing that, and those connectors can go to a very, very concrete level, it's like sending an SMS, and if you want to pull out Twilio at some point in time, you can still do that very easily. Right? So um, that's an important thing to do. And kind of kind of my main motivation to be here actually on stage is, is kind of this. I'm, when, I, when I say low code, I, I get kind of the same reaction from, from most of the developers. It's kind of, ah, oh no, those, those, those kind of bad tools over there, very, very religious in a way. And, oh, don't use low code, it's, it's pretty bad. And I think 
this is true for most of the tools, by the way, but it's a, it's a wrong way of thinking about things. It should be more like, okay, um, we can't stop low code, it, it will come. And by the way, I mean, the whole how we develop software will change over the last, uh, over the next three to five years, big time. Um, I believe in that. I mean, look at GitHub Copilot and stuff. But um, we should think about how actually we can play a role in that. And if, if you think about this kind of, just as an example, this kind of building connectors, reusable connectors, probably just for my own project to get other people involved, it actually means that you, as a developer, have more impact in the organization because what you do um, is use in a lot of these processes. That also helps your organization a lot and it helps you concentrate on the real tech things because you're not, and a lot of developers are not super um, enthusiastic about getting in the whole business discussion. Other people are. Get them in the project. Let them make some work. Last slide here. Um, probably that's kind of the proof slide in a way, so because I was asked that as well. Okay, yeah, come on, you, you did a very successful CSP, and now you have all those investors, you have all this money. I'm pretty sure they ask you that you do low code because that's a big business, and that's 100% not true. Um, so we, we do that because we see, saw that happening. And one example is Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is a big customer of ours. Um, they're using, in this case, Kamunda all over the place. And there, there are talks linked, which recordings, which you can watch, actually. And if you look at the use cases, they um, have two where they talk about. The one is payment processing, so the real payments. That's kind of a core use case, very cr critical, high complexity, and so on and so forth. Very rad. And they also approach that differently to the long tail, where um, the one on the bottom, where Richard, for example, is talking about um, very easy improvements, for example. And they have built their own local tooling on top of Kamuna in that case to roll it out across the firm. And there are a couple of numbers which are pretty impressive how many processes they do. And they are not the only one. We saw that happening at a couple of customers. So that's where we understood that pattern. And I definitely believe in being very valuable. Thank you very much. That's all I have. All right. Thank you very much, Ben. We have time for not so many questions, unfortunately, and there is one. How about it? Okay. That's kind of... Two. <laughs> can, I, can I start answering them, or uh, do you want to count them? Uh, I can just read it for you and then okay. you answer and then that's it. No more questions beyond this point. Who is the target audience for a low-code platform? It certainly is not developers and I have yet to see a business person yep. touching automation tasks. It's, it's a great question. It's, it's, I, I, I hope it was posted early on because I hope I answered that partly in the talk. So the, that's exactly the problem we're seeing. A lot of the low-code platforms are kind of targeted at businesses but then you have kind of a REST connector which cannot be used by a business person. So they are kind of bought by the business but then handed over to IT and IT hates them. And that's why I think you have to find that way in the middle where you say, okay, I, I get it to the right abstraction level and that can be used by the business and I might need developers to customize that, to bring it there. All right, thank you very much. A lot of companies are developing low-code tools. What do you think of vendor lock-in and its risks? Yeah, I mean, that's always a risk. The more, let's say, the higher the abstraction delivered by a vendor is, the more you lock into the abstraction you are using. Um, it's kind of an inherent thing. I think you can um, either live with that, if that's a big vendor, probably that's okay. Um, at least you also save a lot of work you have to do yourself. The other kind of strategy, if you look at what I showed with the connectors, for example, a lot of those connectors you can pre-build in-house for your own organization, so you could probably move them relatively easily from window A to B. And for example, for us it also means a lot of those connectors are open source anyway and GitHub, they're shared in the community. Um, so yes, of course, there's always a bit of vendor login. You can I think you can do a little bit to manage that, and then that should be just worth it. All right. Thank you very much, Bernd. Let's give a warm hand to Bernd for his talk.